TikTok, time to rock. <laughs> why, why, why are people laughing at that? <laughs> guys, you, you can, you guys can show your, show yourselves. Everyone, do a little walk by. We know you all want attention. All right. Come on. <clears throat> all right, here we got John McRae. We got Jorge, gangsta Jorge. We got Mike Winger. Cameron Bertuzzi's Cameron. being left out here, poor we guy. Got Sean. Mixed martial apologetics. That's right. We got Adam. My Adam man Coleman. Coleman. We got Brett Kunkel. What's the greatest team? What's the greatest team in the history of sports, Brett? Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh, come you on. You got it from him. You got it from him, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, Brett is the greatest authority on the history of sports ever. So we all need <laughs> we all want to know what that is. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I'm here with uh, Bobby Conway. Bobby, we're going to talk a bit about your background and history and so on. But uh, I first know you from your YouTube channel. So how long have you been on YouTube? You know, it's funny, uh, probably about 10 years now. And when we jumped on YouTube, uh, really had no clue what YouTube was. We just wanted to do some answers to people's questions. And we delved on, started producing these videos, had no clue on how to produce videos and how to make videos. Uh, we really didn't even know what we were doing. I started getting some interviews from some real well-known apologists and philosophers, and that's really what gave some momentum to our platform and helped it grow. And we started that off while I was in the midst of pastoring a church. And so my life for the last several years has uh, at, at, at times been too busy doing apologetics, pastoring, PhD work, writing books, speaking, and uh, just in a stage where I'm just really simplifying and stokes. I think, you know what, have you been on longer than me, Dave? What year did you start? Uh, I think 2009. Uh, I was on before 2009, but I'm not sure wh when we started uh, on this channel. Um, uh, uh, wait a second, David. What? We got to pause. There's my beautiful wife. Come on over here. Everybody else has been introduced. And, uh, you know, my wife is, uh, just so everybody knows, this is my wife, Heather. Heather, say hello to the peeps. Hi, everybody. So my bride is here keeping us all in check and she's really here to restrain David because if she wasn't, see, he's ruthless. Okay. And it's important. You need to know he is a ruthless man. And so if she wasn't here, well, actually he'll probably be just as ruthless, even though she is here, but I do think he feels a little guilt around her. And so I, I want so. you to be aware of that. And David's so it's going to be David. No where he is. I, I went to Israel with this dude. He doesn't change. He no, 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 no. Bob, Bob, Bobby is actually correct because I would most definitely spend this entire week walking around in my boxers right now. Um, Instead, he's been walking yeah. around naked. And trust me, and, uh, no one wants, no one wants to see that. No one wants to see that. There's yes. a female in the house, so yeah. they yes. have to stay clothes. So I have I'm to sorry. be good. So it's all these apologists and my wife. And I'm so thankful because you know what it did? It it afforded me the opportunity to not have to share a room with another dude, mm -hmm. right? I get to sleep next to my beautiful <laughs> princess here. Yeah, there's a uh, uh, here here at the house. There's uh, <laughs> there are, are rooms with with king beds, and then there are rooms with bunk beds in them. And so uh, if you if you brought a wife, you would automatically have a king bed and not be on a bunk bed. So yeah, I'm here for moral support. What yeah. Can I say? And it was nice of David to bring his lovely bride. Where, where is the good Maria? Uh, uh, she's with our five kids. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, that's good. All right. Well, uh, so YouTube, did, did we figure out who was first? That would be me. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, we're both ADD, so this could be a problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we, we have an interesting kind of situation, <laughs> though. We have an interesting. Hey, uh, you're getting comments about uh, your wife saying she's so beautiful. Oh, thank you, Luis. And uh, she's a nutritionist. <laughs> she's a nutritionist. What does a nutritionist do? Um, they, um, well, they do everything they can to take people like you and help them to not live on a diet of uh, she's chocolate. Been trying. Chocolate she's been chip, telling me. Chocolate chip muffins, <laughs> uh, you know, banana cream pie, uh, uh, you know, peanut butter and banana white bread sandwiches. Um, so they, they assess people like you in this world and they go, you know, you could use a good detox. Yeah. And then they sort of help put together a nice, you know, dietary plan to help work out, uh -huh. you know, the kinks, you know, and you're so teachable, David. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the things that, you know, it's just eager to just learn That's what from I'm others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, she's here to put you on a keto diet. 
<laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> Check you know what? Out. You need to do a fa- like 40 days uh, with Kale and it, David. It would. won't work. It won't work. All right. Uh, you had you had a comment about love the love the hair, but uh, Irene, I don't know who you're talking about, Bobby, um, or you, or his wife, because I don't know. It could go for either one of them, or they could be talking about your hair. Oh, yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, no, let's normally, not... I mean, you got you got you uh, with your you know shaved on the side, and then <laughs> uh, I've heard rumors that you cut your own hair. Is that true? Yeah, you know, I, a lot of times I do. I was the kid in high school. I've always kind of been inclined toward artistic things and so I was the kid in high school and I have friends over at my house lined up and because I was able to do their buzz cuts and then I would bleach the hair and I put the lid on them and so yeah I'd have the long skater looking dude bleached out mm-hmm. with the shave and I always knew how to do the fade so mm-hmm. I still do it man I'll cut the line in and uh sometimes I jack it up and it's no fun it's but, definitely you know. jacked up yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right now um here's what's interesting right so yeah. You say 2009, you started, you started posting videos yeah, on YouTube. Yeah. All right. So I started, I don't remember when I started seeing Bobby's, uh, uh, one minute apologist videos, but when I was watching your videos years ago, um, I would click on it because it was apologetics and I was interested in that. And then but you I were slain in the video. spirit. No, I, I, but I would, I know I would click on your video and I would think, who is this? Perfect Christian, <laughs> Mr. Perfect hair, perfect, perfectly dressed. The whole video, the whole video perfectly produced, uh, perfect sound, everything perfect. Mr. Mr. Goody Two Shoes. How yeah. is this guy going to tell us anything A- here? A.K.A. Oh, A.K.A. The Ken Doll of Apologetics. Ken Doll of Apologetics. Oh, come on now. That's what Jorge Ken calls Ken Doll of Apologetics, fellas. Just yes. know it. Yes, yes. In the Barbie doll of apologetics, no, right here, D Woods. We've, we've seen, we've seen Barbie. We've seen the Barbie already. Yeah, where's the Barbie? Come on back in here, Barbie. I won't take it that far, but he's no Barbie. So that... All right. So, uh, so anyway, so I was thinking. So for I thought that for years. I thought that for years. Um, br- bring him. Young hey, wait. Him. Rachel says Bobby needs a beard, and Rachel, you're exactly right. And I've tried to let my wife know I need a beard. I'd like to grow one of those fat ones like Jorge. But you know what she says? I start growing it out and my wife says, look, if you don't shave that beard, I'm not going to shave my legs. And so at that point, Rachel, the deal was off. I'm like, okay, done. I'll shave. So that's what's happened. Hey, we have a, uh, we have a super chat from... <laughs> Bring Brigham Young... Peace be upon him. So I guess that's a reference, a reference to Muhammad. But uh, bring him young. I'll peace be peace. upon him. Says, uh, says uh, David. Say my name. All right. So back to uh, back to our uh, our awesome story. Uh, Eddie says, uh, please turn it up a notch. Uh, actually, we can't. Uh, we just set up. Um, but this this mic I'm using has no volume control, so we'll try to speak loud. But you're just gonna have to turn up your computers. Um, all right. So Bobby. I was looking at your videos years ago thinking, who is this goody two shoes, Mr. Perfect, trying to tell the rest of us who've actually been through some stuff about the world, what the heck is wrong with this guy, then ignored you for years. Thank you. Yeah. And then we actually, where did we meet? Up in New York? Was it up in New York or was it before that? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, it was, was up in, we, we were up in New York. Yeah, so that was for the CIA conference. Yeah, yeah. So we we met we met in New York, and uh, Bobby comes up and he's like, "Hey, I loved your videos. Oh man, I saw your video where you're wearing your wife's nighty and stuff like that." I'm like, oh, <laughs> what's wrong with this guy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no, then- no, no, no. Do, do, do you hear the irony? I came up to him and said, "Man, I saw your video about you wearing your wife's nighty," and he says, "What's wrong with this guy? Like, the, you're the one wearing a slip." <laughs> so anyway this oh, is yeah. how he was acting and i was like wait a minute you're mr perfect goody two shoes christian shouldn't you walk up to me and go i disapprove of your channel and the way you do things bad person <laughs> right so that's what i was expecting from uh, bobby conway here anyway then we were hanging out over the uh, over that weekend and stuff and i would start hearing bobby tell all these crazy stories and i wasn't really paying attention because what the heck can this guy tell me right all of a sudden i'd be hearing like so anyway, then they wouldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't keep yapping. So I jumped out of the car, going down the highway, and broke my glasses. 
I'm like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> he jumped out of a car. What? He, this guy jumped out of a car? Yeah. Going, 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 going to the airport? So, yeah. uh, did you do that? Yeah. What the heck is wrong with you? A lot. Yeah. It was, uh, Heather and I were dating and, uh, you know, the moral of the story is, is some people would rather jump out of a car than communicate. Uh, mm-hmm. her, Heather and her mom, they were just going and I was sitting shotgun. I said, I can't take it. We were heading down Pacific Coast Highway and I jumped out. And this was when I was a young kid, you know, I was, but I just hated conflict. Didn't know how to deal with it. In the past, I'd always escaped to drugs and alcohol. This time I just jumped out of the car and survived to tell the story. And then when I spoke for family life for almost 10 years, doing marriage conferences with my wife, I would share that. And if you feel like you're struggling communicating in your marriage, uh, I can tell you, I know what that's like. I've jumped out of a car to get away from conflict. Mm-hmm. So, wow. Yeah. Now you told me that you jumped out of an airplane once because you were frustrated with the pilot. What, what happened there? No, no, okay. no, never, never. I, I, I will tell you a funny, yeah. uh, funny airplane story. Uh, there was this guy, <laughs> oh, there was this guy. In a, About in the our, two sitting next to you? Huh? Or is this another airplane story? Oh, no, no, this is a different story. Oh, no, no. Right. no, this yeah. was, uh, my wife was like uh, maybe seven or eight months pregnant with, yeah. our, with our first son, Luke. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy from our church who was like a small plane pilot. Yeah. And he, he was always telling us, hey, you should come out. I'll fly you around. I'll fly you around and stuff yeah. like that. And so finally we're like, okay, you know, I wouldn't mind flying around, flying around the city and stuff. Yeah. So, um, so we go down there and we see him like, you know, talking to, talking to someone and arguing and stuff like that. And he's, all right, let's go ahead and get in. So we go out, get in the plane. It's a little four seater, right? Yeah. So it's me and him up in up in the front, and and Marie in the back, and we again pregnant Marie, seven months pregnant Marie, and so anyway we we fly up, and he flies around, and we land, and everything's fine, and then uh, I was in this this sort of discipleship meeting with this guy. Yeah. Uh, the next day, and they said, anyone have any uh you know you know answers to prayer or praises? Anyone wants to wants to share? And he says, yeah, I got a I got a good one. He goes, yesterday I, I met with a couple of friends. Uh, I was going to, you know, take them up in the plane. They had to drive like half an hour to get there. Um, but, you know, the, the mechanic, he told me, he said, uh, you, you can't take the plane up today. It's, it's, just, it's just not a good day. There are too many, I'm getting too many warning signals and stuff on it. Uh, you can't take it up today. Someone's going to die. And I said, well, I can't just send them home. <laughs> can't just send, send them home, so I'm just going to pray. So I prayed, and I said, God, you know, please let, let, let this plane last for this flight and so that we all don't die, yeah. right? And we went up and we came down. We're all safe. So, hey, that's awesome. And I, I was, I started, I was like, I was like ready. To, I was ready to jump on this dude. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, he, he just cracked up laughing. So, so it was, it was a, it was a funny story. It was, it was just ma- messing with me. So, so it got in your head. Cool. Yeah. Yo, was, you yeah, have yeah. a lot of airplane stories, dude. Yeah, I like I the one cool. you told earlier. I know you don't have time for it now, but that was, that was funny. <clears throat> all right. So, uh, Bobby, we're going to talk about a, a more serious topic here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Namely, your raving alcoholism <laughs> do you see him no. you see well, how nuts this guy is i talk about a serious topic like no, yeah. alcoholism and he starts cracking no, up like well, it's a joke do, well, yeah but everybody out there knows that when you say something you are not your raving alcoholism right like, like we're gonna talk about your psychopathy and <laughs> your crazy brain all right let's do it uh, we're both crazy that's why we connect uh, side note, Romans, uh, Romans 10, nine here said, um, Romans 10, nine said, Hey, David, Marie did a few videos on Christmas about three years ago. They were absolutely brilliant, really informative. She should do a few more. Uh, it's actually correct. The, the, the reason Marie stopped making videos was, uh, we, we told this before, back in the day when we were making videos and, uh, you know, I was in front of my bookshelf, we were actually in our tiny little bedroom and I was wedged in between, uh, the bookshelf and the bed to make those videos. So, when I wanted to record Marie at, with a different background, um, I actually had, I would drape something over our, our uh, bedroom window, and then I would have to completely rearrange the room so that there could be a, a room for her to be standing there while I recorded her. And it was such a massive ordeal to rearrange the room every time I went to record it that basically we, you know, we got sick of it and, and stopped. But uh, that's, a, that's a different situation. Uh, it's a different situation now, and uh, we do have more space. So, yes, uh, one of our goals for this year is for Marie to get back to making videos, and she's got some uh, epic ones coming up. One of the things we're planning, one of the things we're planning on is sort of a massive, this would be cool, we're going to do like a massive series 
on the resurrection for Easter coming up. We're hoping to go get, uh, record some like historians like Mike Lacona, Gary Habermas and so on, record them on the resurrection. Uh, but then, you know, me and Marie uh, sort of tie them together, right? Like, so we'll say, you know, we'll be making the points and then say, and here's Gary Habermas to bring up this point. So uh, yeah, so expect that coming up here pretty soon. Why does inspiring philosophy keep walking by trying to distract us? You see that? Oh, Some- I, I missed that one, but he has been, uh- you know, giving us a hard time, right? Yeah, he has. He's yeah. trouble. He's counts in trouble. Um, all right. So, Bobby, as you know, uh, I have a family that, that struggles with addiction, both to drugs and to alcohol. I believe I'm the first, I believe I'm the first person in my family line that has not been an alcoholic. So my yeah. dad drank himself to death. His dad drank himself to death. Um, my mom was an alcoholic, although she died of a drug overdose. Um, her dad, uh, was a lifelong alcoholic, her mother. So my grandmother on my mom's side is the, is the only person that I know in my family was, uh, who was not an, an, an alcoholic, uh, and, or a drug addict. So, uh, an issue that affects Certainly my family um, affects, uh, yeah, not just me, my brothers and so on. Both of my brothers have been locked up for drugs. Um, uh, Most of you know my brother Manny right now is uh, still basically fighting for uh, his life and his cognitive functions right now um, because of a drug overdose. Um, my, my My brother John has been locked up for drugs. His wife died of an aneurysm, but I've heard from medical uh, people who, uh, doctor who said that, that, that even that's probably related to drugs, even though it wasn't an overdose, uh, that you know, doing drugs over a period of time actually can, can, can lead to other problems down the road. So um, lots of stuff going on. And Bobby, you happen to have some experience in this area. I have, oh, <laughs> this is actually a good one. We'll both comment on this. Um, let's get this up on the screen here. <clears throat> Dorgon Reborn said, what's your thoughts on family curses? I used to be an alcoholic as well, and I feel personally that because some of my family had alcoholic problems that I, have, I may have been prone to it. Um, you have any thoughts on this? Well, I definitely uh, look at it more like uh, DNA, yep. that people can have some of the DNA issues that can be passed on. So alcoholism can certainly be spread, I think, through the genes. Uh, I prefer that better than talking about family curses. Mm. That would be the way that I would look at that. There's a language for that, but I, I wouldn't look at it like that. I mean, yes, I don't think it's God cursing me with alcoholism for what my ancestors did. I think there are consequences uh, at, that happen as a result. Mm-hmm. That's why I'd say that. Yeah, and uh, there, there are basically two things. Uh, so you, I think you can be, mm-hmm. you know, have more of a genetic predisposition to addictive behavior or to dangerous behavior, like like everyone, uh, at least on my mom's side, apart from my grandmother, just has always done extremely dangerous stuff, right? M- massive risk takers and stuff like that. Something like that might be uh, genetic, um, but there's also uh, there are also some other factors. Um, that you can have sort of generational sins, whether we want to, want to call it a curse or not. Uh, there's sort of generational sins. Namely, you, you grow up around your family, and so you're influenced by your family. Um, and in, in our, the church we went to in New York, we would actually, they would do something. They would do something. They would actually uh, have you sit down and sort of map out your, your family line, your family tree. And then they would ask you all kinds of questions. You know, what was your grandfather's relationship with your grandmother like? What was your father's relationship with your mother like? And how would you describe all of these things and so on? And what, what would happen is you would look at, at all, the, all the things that you tend to do as, that are messed up or all the, the relationship issues you have or the way you treat certain people and stuff. You can very often trace them back to other to you know other relationships that were a model for you as you as you were growing up and uh it, the reason was so that you could be aware of that and then try to counteract any uh you know any any bad patterns of behavior but uh yeah for, fortunately for me um with alcoholism and drug addiction uh even though i did have the tendency to risky behavior and so on uh i was fortunate 
to be a psychopath in, in one way. So ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to be a, a psychopath, but it did help me in that um, psychopaths become narcissists over time and egomaniacs, and they view themselves as superior to all other people that they, you know, they regard as inferior because they react so emotionally to things. Well, one of the, the one of the, the positive things that can come out of that is when people are trying to peer pressure you into, yeah. oh, do some drugs or alcohol, you view them as like inferior beings. So yeah. how dare you try to peer pressure me? Yeah, control you. Yeah, how dare you do yeah. that? What, what, why would you think that you could even right. do that? And so what was cool, the, the, the cool part was I never got into that. I never got into that stuff. And then eventually I became a Christian. And then after I was a Christian, I didn't have that struggle like right. other people had. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just I had I had no inclination to do that sort of sort of thing. So, guys, if you have problems, you know, make some lemonade, make some lemonade out of those things. All right, Bobby. We're here because you have a background in some struggles. And with with you, it's not simply, hey, this is this long, you know, this. Let me put it this way. As Christians, we tend to think lots of times, right? Because, and, and I've, I've heard this over and over and over and over and over again from Christians about my brother. And guys, I'm gonna tell you, some of y'all need to be quiet sometimes, right? Because I said in one video, um, the first video after my, when my brother was in the hospital, they didn't, know that, they didn't know if he had completely destroyed his brain, right? I walk out and I say, you know, drug addiction, that, that's one of the problems I've never been able to figure out because it's almost like you have to be perfect for the rest of your life. If you, if you get off this stuff, it's almost like you have to be perfect for the rest of your mm -hmm. life because if you have that, that sort of personality where you turn to drugs because, you know, you're having a bad day, well, guess what? You're going to have a bad day eventually, right? Yep. If, if you turn to drugs or alcohol or something like that, when you get depressed, guess what? Eventually you're going to get depressed. So... How do you, you know, how can you just be perfect for the rest of your life when eventually things are going to be going really, really wrong? And then yeah. it's just, hey, I'll, you know, one time for old time's sake, and then you're right back in there. Mm. And I said, I've never figured out how to really solve that problem because, you know, you yeah. can, you know, apart from just stand, hovering over my brother every day for the rest of my life constantly and actually physically restraining him if necessary, I don't know how I would have kept him off from, from, from ever doing drugs right. again. And I would hear from Christians, oh, you know, you, well, you just you just pray and then God will help you. And then it, and then you don't have to struggle with with that, that sort of thing yeah. anymore. But they would say it in like this condescending. Yeah. David, you're so dumb. How could you as a Christian not know that, you know, your brother just needs to turn to Jesus. Yeah. And then you don't have to, you know, and and, and they would they would make this mistake, which I've seen over and over again, which is David, I was a drug addict or David, I was, you know, I struggled with alcoholism and I became a Christian and then I didn't have that problem anymore. And I see that same thing, that same pattern over and over again. This is how things worked for me. Therefore, this is how things work. Yep. And therefore, you know, if your brother, he just, you know, prays and turns his life to Jesus, he's not going to have that problem anymore. Yeah. And the issue I have, Bobby, is some people, for some people, it doesn't work like that. They turn to Jesus, they serve Jesus, they go to church, they read their Bible, and they still struggle with things. They still struggle with those addictions. So, um, yeah, I'd like your comments on that. Well, so just to give your audience a little bit of my story, I grew up in California, never heard the gospel till I was 19. At the age of 15, I started turning to alcohol and drugs and alcohol in particular, I love the way it made me feel because ever since I could remember as a little kid, I wrestled with feeling anxious uh, for no reason. And I think a healthy emotional response to life is our emotion should correspond to reality. And when you feel fearful as if someone's chasing you with an ax and nobody is, our emotions aren't corresponding to reality. I felt a kind of anxiety that I could not put my finger on it and I did not know why exactly. And when I drank, I felt normal. I felt good. I felt like I could relax. So when I was younger, um, you know, it would turn to, you know, you start off with alcohol, you start, you know, smoking dope. And before you know it, lines are being put in front of you and, you know, you're taking LSD. I mean, I remember writing a check for $2 at the Santa Cruz boardwalk from a drug dealer for a hit of acid as a teenager. Um, you know, and seeing my life spiral down was collecting guilt, living very promiscuous, totally lost. And I found myself 
wanting a sense of purpose so much. When I got saved at uh, the age of 19, I still struggled with alcohol abuse. In fact, I remember going to Greg Laurie's Harvest Crusade uh, in Southern California. I got saved under his ministry. I left the Harvest Crusade event, 50,000 people at this event, and I got off at the nearest exit and bought myself a 12 pack and was inebriated. And everything I kept trying to do to get clean wasn't working. Why? Well, because before as a Christian, I lived according to my feelings. Whatever I felt, I did. I would live by my impulses. So I was very impulse driven and everything inside of me told me, I just have to shut that anxiety down. And so that's why I need a drink. That's why I need a bong hit. That's why I need a drop of LSD to escape. So toward the end of my ropes, I sold my car. I drank that all away. I took a student loan. I drank that all away. Uh, coming off of a nine day hard drinking binge on October 9th, 1994, I would go to AA and got clean. I would do over 400 meetings of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, in my first year of sobriety. My life became so free. I was being discipled. I was being taught how to live according to truth. I was learning how to submit my feelings to truth. My anxiety would still come and go throughout the years. Fast forward 23 years in, and this is the way life can work. I'm 46 years old right now. And when you're in your early 20s, you're full of vision. You're just getting married. You have all these dreams. But then what can start to happen is you start asking yourself questions when you're, you know, at about 40. Does life feel like I thought it would when I was younger? Does my marriage feel like I thought it would? Have I raised kids the way that I thought I would? Does my mission feel like I thought it would? Uh, you know, and you get saved. I didn't even know what questions to ask. It, you know, I got saved on asking very limited questions. And now my mind had been growing. I've studied philosophy, apologetics. I mean, all, I mean I've just been living in books for 20, 25 years. So what ends up happening is I slip into a dark night of the soul about five, six years ago with doubt. Thought I was losing my faith altogether. Thought I was going to be an apostate. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is going to connect though. Hold on, hold on. Yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm confused. You've been doing apologetics for a long time. Yeah. Been sharing apologetics. Right. Cranking out videos. Yep. You were having doubts. Yeah. The doubts, uh, you know, there's a difference between skeptical doubt and sincere doubt. The thing is, is I was deep into my philosophy degree, processing so much information that the books that I was reading and the articles I was reading was presenting me with so many questions that I didn't have the time to chase down all of the answers. And I felt like it somewhere along the lines, I just need the next answer. I just need the next answer. I just need the ex next answer. And so I got an, had an OCD relationship with trying to nail down my answers. I, I was preaching and doing apologetics by faith. I hated my doubts. I wasn't celebrating them. I didn't want them, but I was going, God, please help me with this. But for every book I'd read to deal with the doubt, I'd learn 10 other books that I needed to read to chase that down. So I had to renegotiate my faith stance to be something more than just getting all of my unanswered questions answered. I needed to learn how to live with questions that I might not ever be able to answer. But that dark night of the soul sent me into depression, ended up on antidepressants, uh, was sharing with our church leadership. And all of this is going to affect you as a husband, as a dad. I was shutting down. I was detached. I had suicidal thoughts. I didn't want to be alive. I was really empty. And it was hard for me because I saw myself as somebody very hungry for God, trying to be faithful for God, trying to study my Bible, trying to, trying to live for the Lord. Yet, I was being buffeted and coming out of the doubts. I go, man, I hated that. I don't, but doubts can be the making of an apologist. And it also can make you compassionate. Jude says, be merciful to those who doubt. And I learned that everything isn't quite as black and white as I once thought it was. We need some borders. We need some boundaries, but it taught me compassion. And you know, that's what suffering does. It puts us in the circle of compassion. Well, my doubts was hard for my wife. My doubts was hard for my kids. They looked at me. It was like seeing empty soul. I was so on fire for Christ. I mean, I was the guy that would go out and preach on benches. I would witness to 50 to 100 people a week. I was on fire. I fasted 40 days, fasted 20 days. Seeing all that passion go away and my mission die down and my marriage struggles result of this, I turned to thinking, well, what could I drink? So 
I hadn't had a drink in almost 23 years. And this time I wasn't wanting a drink. You hadn't had a drink in 23 years, almost 23 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. So when people hear, Oh, you know, you messed up and you drink the, I think the proper response would be, man, that's pretty cool as an alcoholic that God gave you 23 years. Mm -hmm. What went wrong? How do we help you? How do we deal with that? But that's not always the response people have. Mm -hmm. It's your whole statement. You, when you're like, if you're a foodie, imagine you love food, but you have to go the rest of your life without ever eating food again, or you love, uh, you know, whatever it is, you just got to give it up. Well, the attic has to give it up forever. And by God's grace for almost two and a half decades, I did not touch it. But what ended up happening is, um, I asked, I asked myself, could I drink in moderation? So I started doubting step one of AA. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe I saw that my life became manageable in other areas. You know, I thought, man, I've been a faithful, faithful husband. And, uh, you know, I can exercise self-control. Maybe I can have it in this area. And it would be nice to have a glass of wine at the end. I have no problem with drinking in moderation. Not, the Bible doesn't either. So, so ju just to be clear, because I saw, I saw earlier people, people asking about that, the view of view of alcohol. Yeah. You, if someone doesn't have a problem with alcohol yeah. and you know, they, they drink wine. With I dinner, pour wine like for my, for, for my wife, not when I'm in the mm -hmm. throes of trying to get cleaned up, but yeah, of course, no, I don't, mm -hmm. that, I feel like that would be me imposing my issues of alcoholism on people who can drink in moderation. Mm -hmm. And I can't do that. Um, it's a conscious thing and everybody's alcoholic struggles look different. They're rooted in different things. We drink for different reasons, but here was the difference this time. I couldn't see my alcoholism. Do you know when I was starting to incorporate, just seeing if I could do it, it wasn't because I wanted to go out party, find girls like when, you know, my pre-married, pre-Christian days. It was, I just would like to take the edge off. And so I thought that would be nice. And most all the people I was around drank, I just hadn't. So what happened was I went online and I typed in, how much does a moderate drinker drink? Now the alcoholic in me couldn't even see that that a normal person doesn't do that. And so then I realized, oh, the moderate drinker drinks no more than three and four drinks in one night over a certain period of time, or no more than 14 drinks in a week. So you're like, I can do that. So I thought, great, I'll start there. <laughs> you know, I'll st right, I'll start there. And uh, you know, I've always been like, I listen, look, I'm the guy that I remember going to get thinking I had to have a surgery. And when I found out that I didn't have to have a surgery, I was bummed because that meant I didn't get the opioids when I left. Okay. Now, can you imagine that sickness? Okay. I can remember having a vasectomy. You see, you see, why I thought. You see why I said. Well, I'm just, you see why I said. Like, Wait, this guy's. This guy's not perfect. Chris, he's more messed up than I am. This guy. <laughs> this guy's mad that he doesn't need surgery because he wants him to shoot him up with some opioids. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I'm the guy. We have two. I, like, I, yeah. I my wife's laughing in the background. She's cracking up, laughing at this. Well, this she knows what an addict I am. Yeah. And, and well, the, you know, you know, what's cool is that means she's she's a good wife for you, right? Like, right. like, like. Like my wife is, you know, she'll laugh at my mental yeah. health issues and yeah. stuff like that. And it's yeah. good because otherwise, yeah, we'd have a lot more problems than we do. Well, my wife will say you and David are a lot alike in the way your brains work. Like, like I can't take one roll aid without wondering what a thousand will do. Okay. So <laughs> it's kind of like, so I've got two kids in a vasectomy. Okay. Now this is a, you got to understand, I get sent home with opioids and you know, I'm the guy four days after the surgery going yeah, there's still a little bit of pain there. Mm -hmm. I would be counting, oh, the four hours is here so I can have, so I'd have to flush those things down the toilet. I just don't do good with this. Well, so here I did my little report. I thought I was being methodical and wise and go, okay, I'll start there. And uh, man, it was just so difficult. Um, the moment I drank, even if I wasn't drinking, I think I was obsessing on alcohol 100% of the time. Now here's mm -hmm. the definition of an alcoholic. An alcoholic is one who obsesses on alcohol when they're not drinking. And the moment they take a sip, the phenomenon of crave kicks in. And the phenomenon of crave is there's no satisfaction. So for the alcoholic, I go out to a restaurant, I watch people drink. My eye is on how fast people are bringing down their drinks. And when somebody like my hat's off to the person who can drink a half a beer, leave and leave it there. If I was in an alcoholic state, I'd go finish the beer off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, 
I, that's the definition. If you go, man, am I an alcoholic? Do you obsess on alcohol when you're not drinking? And when you start to drink, does the phenomenon of crave come in, kick in? And that's what would happen. I'd start drinking. I'd start craving. Well, as a pastor, as a Christian, I was trying to moderate as, as good as I could. But then I would find myself subtly going into stages where I would be pouring a little extra or going out into the garage when my wife wasn't aware and taking a little swig. And it was just growing and getting hard. And within six months, I was back in AA, show up, and I was a pastor of a large church. And lo and behold, all these people that had been to our church are in there. And that's a scary spot when you're a well-known pastor in a community. You show up at AA, and now you're going, can I trust you guys with this? And I felt scared, and I, I, but I wanted help. I needed community. Mm-hmm. And so I remember I share my story. We do the Lord's Prayer at the end of the meeting, and the person right when we're done, they're holding my hand. Oh, man, Pastor Bobby, that was so good to hear. I, was like, I didn't want to share that I was a pastor. <laughs> I'm like, you know, so I'm like, you know, so six. So that was six months after I'm back in AA. The good that came out of it is we started AA in our church, still going strong to this day. But then I would put together six months of getting clean, and then I had a hard three-day relapse. Mm. Um, I found myself uh, driving south down the freeway, picking up whiskey. Whiskey is, is my Achilles heel. And uh, I didn't even mean for this to happen. But, man, I started drinking whiskey at about 3 in the afternoon and about 2 in the morning. Uh, you know, I, I had uh, went through, uh, you know, a bottle of whiskey, almost a bottle of wine, uh, and woke up at 6 six in the morning, four hours later to finish the bottle off. And that was the last I ever drank. But I realized in that moment, see, sadly, an alcoholic can't deal with the question of, am I? That curiosity will kill you. But thank God, you know, if you don't remember your last fall, it, it might not be your last fall. And so I'd say for David, like with Manny, um, you know, this was pretty tragic. What happened to him? And hopefully tragic enough that he'll never forget that. For me, that was tragic to see. How does a guy fall asleep at two in the morning, wake up four hours later looking to finish the bottle off? Mm -hmm. That's alcoholism. And by God's grace, um, I've been clean for about a year and a half. I would share it with the body uh, at large. The church where I pastored, the story, the the body at large loved me very well. Mm -hmm. And I was thankful for that. Um, uh, the, the way that it was handled and some of the internal stuff was incredibly painful and hard, Mm -hmm. but I was so thankful to the body at large for their love and support. So that's a little bit of the story, man. And then I, God used that though, to re he's so merciful and so gracious that in our struggles, I get blown away that how in a moment like that of my brokenness, he could restore my passion to him in a greater way than I felt in years. But I did feel I needed to resign from the church. Um, not because I had to, I just felt like I needed to simplify my life. And today I'm pursuing full-time apologetics through my YouTube ministry and I'm doing Pastor's Perspective Radio in Southern California. Well, yeah, you are a bona fide loser, man. That's All that right. Stuff. Yeah, capital L <laughs> loser, right? Yeah, uh, here's, a, here's a comment from my wife. She just, uh, she sent me a text. She said, remember us trying to have a non-alcoholic wedding because of the alcoholism on both sides of the family. And your grandpa had a tailgate party in the venue <laughs> parking lot. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that actually happened. We realized we have, we have so many alcoholics on both sides of the family that we were, uh, we decided, all right, no alcohol. <laughs> They're all going to get drunk. It's going to be yeah. horrible. And so my grandpa showed up with, uh, yeah. with, uh, who knows how many bottles out there at the tailgate. And then of course, all the family members, who are alcoholics sort of eased on out to the, uh, to the party out there. So, yeah, you can, you can try to have a non-alcoholic, uh, op- opportunity, but if the alcoholic wants to drink, the alcoholic's going to drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's just, <clears throat> that's just the way that it is. You know, looking back, I think what led me to that then, mm-hmm. you know, like, so you're out there, what leads somebody to this? And I think, um, I think in some ways I had lost, um, my joy in doing what I was doing as a pastor, it began, I just felt like some of it was so, um, I can't, you know, I can't meet my own expectations, let alone everyone else's expectations. Well, no, if you're, uh, see, 
you project this perfect Christian image. And so your goal is clearly like perfect, perfect perfection, Christian, best Christian in the world. And you just can't, you can't, well, plead, you can't, you see that on, you can't reach out. You, know, you can't reach you know, that. You goal. Know, well, you know, the funny thing hmm. you see that cause our videos are, are, um, well produced, but anybody who sat under me as a pastor, I just spoke like I just did just now. Mm-hmm. I'm just a very transparent, vulnerable guy. But I think that it's funny. It's true because when you're only doing these short videos, I'm just answering a question. There's not a lot of time for personality. Mm-hmm. You're just kind of given the answer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's why opportunities like this. But the, but, but the Bobby, the me of who I am is, is just laying my heart out there, being transparent. Um, you know. But I do think you have to be careful with who you're transparent with. Um, mm-hmm. And at the right time, the part that was hard is just after the relapse, I felt so vulnerable and I needed some space with my family and that wasn't afforded to us. It was like, we got to let the church know right away. And, and it was like, man, when somebody's trying to get clean and sober, just walk alongside of them, help them to have a little bit of privacy because they obviously drank because of pressure. Let's not make matters a hundred times worse. And so I think sometimes there's a way to properly minister to people who are obviously in a horrific state. Mm. And uh, that was the part that was just, I got to resign. I I, I can't, I've got to find a place for me where I can feel really safe being who I am. And I ended up uh, moving out to Cali and starting this new setup. And I'm just so thankful for what the Lord's done in it. And I want to help alcoholics the rest of my life. So what, uh, what do you think the the odds are of you uh, drinking again? May, yeah. You know, I don't that Paul says it clearly, right? Take heed uh, when you think you stand strong, lest you fall. And for me, I can't even think about odds like that. For me, there's two days in a week that I can't worry about. And that's yesterday and tomorrow. Um, I hope. And I, I'm trusting God to help me to not drink before I go to bed in four hours and 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I'll wake up, wake up in the morning and I'm hoping that God will just give me the grace to not drink tomorrow. And that's one of the things that I think people, uh, coming alongside of addicts and other things, it could just be, Oh, just don't drink. Just don't do this. It's just, it's just not that simple. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's very like when I was a teenager, I practically took a BB gun and turned it around on my head and shot the crap out of my prefrontal cortex. When you drink and use drugs the way that I did, you mess up the self-control center. So I can have impulsive thoughts still to this day. You, you hear it, you hear it coming out like, uh, and some of it's just the ADD brain, but I have to every day lean into Jesus. And one thing an alcoholic has a hard time with is typically behind the alcoholism is, is anxiety or mm-hmm. depression or unprocessed wounds. And so what ends up happening is I got to make sure my wounds are processed and what causes my anxiety oftentimes is I don't know how to be in the moment. I don't know how to feel the ground beneath my feet. So I struggle living in the future, trying to solve future contingencies, worrying about things that will never happen. So I'm sandwiched between future emotions of fears, worries, doubts, anxieties, and past emotions, regret, shame. And I have to learn how to live in the present because God revealed himself as the I am. That means he's the present one. When I have encountered the presence of God, that's me experiencing being present. And when I'm just missing out on being present, feeling the ground beneath my feet, I miss those opportunities. And so I know I'm in a danger zone when the stinking thinking starts getting in place and I just start uh, dwelling on my anxieties. And so that question, and it's not fair, like let's say I was to go try to be a pastor somewhere. And they were like, well, can you guarantee you'll never drink again? Mm. Like, that's an unfair thing. Like I had a leadership group once. They said to me, Bobby, you're, you're like this in your life, right? And they said, we need you to be like this. And I responded, in other words, you need me to be more like you? I've always been like this. Mm-hmm. And some of that is brain type. I'm left brain, logical, analytical, but I'm very right brain. And the, if you're very artistic, right brain, abstract, that is interrupts your brain chemistry so that you don't always stay stable on the left side. That's why so many artists and musicians are alcoholics and addicts because they do not have that stable state of being purely left brain. And so if you surround yourself with a bunch of left brain people, it won't make sense. And they'll just speak to you from a logical standpoint. So for me, 
I have to do everything I can to stay around people that are compassionate, loving, endearing. They're not going to throw stones at you. But I also have to realize, man, I'm a lot to deal with at times, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I, it is a lot. And when they're saying this, they're saying, Bobby, I'm worn out. And, and I have to have some go, thought and go, yeah, that's true. You know, that must be a lot. You know, I wear my wife out. Uh, I wear my kids. I wear yeah, myself yeah, I mean, out. Yeah, if I'm around you for a couple hours, I just want to like choke the life out of you sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just the way it works and vice versa. So, um, but man, uh, I think that we're just, the way that we can't approach life is I think we look at people and think we're all born with the same brain states, tabula rasa, this blank state. But no, we're all a product of our experiences, our pain, our education, our mentors, the context we grew up in, the books we read, our experiences with God, the church we had. And what happens is, is when we're talking with people, we need to take time to understand all of that. Otherwise, we'll just project and think, well, why don't they think like that? Mm -hmm. Like, I'll even trip out sometimes in my relationship. Think about you. How long have you been married to Maria? Uh, what is it? 17 years? Okay. Something like that. Yeah. So isn't a trip you two hang out all the time you're connecting, but isn't it funny that both of you are connecting and there's no way to know which memory she has of you guys so far in which memories you have of you guys so far, mm -hmm. but you come together and you assume you have the same mental experience mm -hmm. and you can project on each other. But the truth is she's bonded to you on some things that you can't even remember and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so the relationships are funny and it just takes time for us to understand the way that this thing called chemistry and, and, and compassion and understanding each other works. It's not as easy as just saying, don't do this. This is the way it is. Mm -hmm. Amen to that brother Bobby. And, uh, this guy said the blank state theory is complete rubbish. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. Gerard or Gerard. <laughs> Yeah, there are pro there are problems with it. Uh, if you guys don't know what we're talking about, this is actually uh, it's actually an uh, issue in uh, philosophy whether uh, human beings start out as a blank slate yeah. or something else. Um, comment mm -hmm. from Michelle Marie here said, uh, "I was a born again Christian for years before I became a heroin addict. I have been clean for years now, but I am evidence it uh, can happen to anyone. God released me from the addiction." when I surrendered to him. And so, yeah, go, going back to what I was, what I was saying earlier, um, that there is this tendency among Christians, right? Uh, if you're a Christian and, uh, because this does happen, right? Um, there, it, it does happen where a person can be an alcoholic for 20 years and convert. And this person is just completely liberated and ha has no desire for alcohol or for drugs or for whatever, whatever the problem was before. Um, but, it's you got to be careful. See, if, if that happens to you, then you have been blessed. It does not mean everyone have, has been blessed with the, the same experience. So, um, uh, yeah, you, what, what you don't want to say, what you don't want to say is, therefore, this is how it should work um, for everyone else, uh, because I, I've I've, exp I've experienced the same thing with with different kinds of issues um, like you know, I still don't have normal emotional reactions to things. So yeah. uh, I've heard, I've heard, I've been told, matter of fact, I saw it in a comment for, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, I did some videos with Bobby Conway. And so he was interviewing me and he was, it's interesting because people who, people who interview me for something, it's usually either like about my testimony or about Islam. So various questions were uh, in, uh, involved in Islam. And uh, Bobby said he wanted to interview me. It was it was like, uh, you know, uh, what's the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? And, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, it, it was it was all questions related to sociopathy and stuff like that and psychopathy and stuff. And but by the way, why, why was that? So the reason I wanted to interview David is my Ph.D. research is uh, I developed an argument from uh, the moral argument from guilt. And so with David, where I find him very interesting, and I, and I talk about him uh, for a little bit in my research, because as a psychopath, he doesn't have the capacity to feel guilt. So isn't it interesting, the very thing that we need in order to become a Christian is a, to recognize our guilt. So you have to distinguish between the fact of guilt and feelings of guilt. Not everybody who feels guilty is in fact guilty. There's pseudo guilt, but there are people who, uh, who can uh, recognize their guilt 
the fact of guilt and not be guilty. And David falls into that category where he can recognize the fact of guilt, though he doesn't have guilt feelings. And so where he really was such an intrigue to me is I think about my life and I wonder if you guys think about this too, like, man, like guilt has been something in some ways I hate it after messing up, but the fear of having guilt also is a moral motivator for me at times Mm -hmm. to do the right thing. Well, David doesn't have that capacity, that, that, that instrumental grace of guilt feelings to help protect him. He doesn't even know what that is. So he could go do the dumbest thing in the world and he won't even feel guilty. He could recognize that was wrong as a fact, but he wouldn't feel it. And so in my opinion, uh, I, I have a massive amount of respect for his Christian walk because think about it. He is walking to honor God, not out of fear of feeling guilt, but out of just doing what's right for right's sake. And I go, man, maybe what if sometimes in my life, I just don't want the guilt, but if I could see, if I could get away with it, would I, you know, if if we could put on the ring of guy G's, right? What would we do? Well, guess what? Uh, He's got the ring on. It's not going to affect him. And he does the right thing. And I think that's a cool thing. I'm smiling because you keep dropping all these subtle references to you knowing philosophy, right? You know what I mean? You, oh. keep, you keep having it toss in. Oh, by the way, okay, for, well, all the, Smeagol, for, all or... the, for all the philosophers out there, I've read The Republic. I, yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Lord of the Rings, okay. <laughs> um, uh, no, so, so anyway, so yeah, so Bobby uh, was asking me questions along uh, those lines for our videos on his channel, One Minute Apologist. Uh, by the way, if you're not subscribed to One Minute Apologist and you'd like to hear more from Bobby, uh, he's been doing apologetics for years and he continues putting out uh, more material. A link to his channel is in the description box, so be sure to be sure to subscribe. Yes. He needs help from, from the <laughs> massive channels, from the massive channels like mine. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I, you know, I, I, we, we've been, we, you know, w- wanted to focus on, on listening to Bobby. So, you know, I've seen people uh, signing up as channel members and so on. Awesome. Uh, shout out to everyone who signed up. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, so anyway, he, uh, he was asking me questions about that, but then there would be someone in the comments section um, saying, David, you know, I was a psychopath, but then I became a Christian and my problems went away. And so... And, and the, the, the yeah. conclusion is that I'm, if I'm not that way, then, you know, I mean, maybe, you know, I, I, I should be questioning my salvation. Projecting or something his like that. experience on yours. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's just uh, that if you take anything else away from that, just be, just, you know, people are individuals and um, your experience doesn't necessarily map onto uh, other people's uh, experiences. Um, and a matter of fact, here's it. <laughs> this was funny. Uh, I was. 18 years old when I was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Uh, most of you here know the story. Uh, if not, you can watch my video, Why I Am a Christian. But I was in a mental hospital because I had smashed my dad's head in with a hammer. Um, they uh, evaluated me and they gave me a diagnosis, antisocial personality disorder, which is what psychopaths and sociopaths have. And uh, when I got the, the, the report, I looked at it and it said, uh, it said people like David Wood are incapable of remorse. And I looked at that and I so disliked people telling me what I well, yeah, could, yeah. couldn't do that. I was actually, how dare you tell me that I'm incapable of remorse. And so I'm starting to think I was trying to prove them wrong. I was trying to think, have I ever felt remorse? What did I ever feel bad about? I couldn't think of anything, right? Couldn't you wouldn't happen to be an eight on the Enneagram, David, would you? No, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, so yeah, anyway, that, that, that's a little side note there, but, uh, all right, Bobby. So here's yeah. now here's, here's the, here's the problem, right? So we're pointing out, Hey, don't, don't project your experiences onto other people. They might have completely different experiences. Um, even you, you know, your salvation experience, don't project that onto other people because theirs theirs might be completely different. So we want to say, you know, people are different and they're going to have uh, different kinds of struggles. Even if it's, you know, the same substance, they can have the, you know, they can have completely different kinds of struggles with it. But, but how do we then help other people who might be struggling? Right. Because, yeah, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you, you know, you're, uh, you've had this struggle for a long time, but other people have, you know, it, it's different for them. So how can, you know, how can we help others? So in, in other words, it's, we're all different, but we, 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 
we do have just recurring patterns of the same uh, yeah. similar behavior. So uh, what do you have to say to other people out there, especially the Christians who, yeah. um, who, you know, you, 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 you give your life to Jesus, you go to church for years, and then you find yourself in some uh, very, very bad, very uh, damaging behavior. Yeah. Uh, what do you got to do about that? Okay. So here's a couple things. Number one, I think it's important for us to really model grace, right? God's kindness leads us to repentance. When somebody has a moral failure, um, they don't need necessarily, right, to be bombarded with stones. I mean, especially if they recognize, man, I hate that this happened, right? When that's the posture of somebody, they need to be walked out of shame, and they need to be walked out of that pain. Now, here's the problem. We talk a lot about the gospel in our church at large, right? About what grace is. There was a time when the culture that we live in shared the same values as the church. So take, for example, the values of marriage, not getting a divorce, um, even abortion, homosexuality, uh, different types of things like drugs, alcohol, well, what ended up happening is, is our culture has legalized the material that we inside the church say is sin that the Holy Spirit would use to convict people of their need for God's grace. So what ends up happening is, is the culture often looks a lot more gracious than the church. Because what happens is, is inside the church, people think, well, uh, if, you know, like for example, God hates divorce, but he doesn't hate those who get divorced. He hates the pain that it causes to people. He hates that it, you know, shatters the broken covenant picture, but he doesn't hate those who got a divorce. So if someone goes through a divorce, well, they feel like they feel shamed in the church often, right? So what do they have to do? They might get church discipline out of a church and then they go down the street and they go to a church offering divorce care, or somebody might get church discipline for alcoholism and then they go to celebrate recovery down the church. And so it's like on one side, you're getting kicked out and on the other side, you're being welcomed in. And we don't know whether how, how to handle truth and grace together. So we have to realize that the culture we live in has legalized many of the things that we call sin. So we have a future generation emerging that we have to, we can't just jump out of the gate and say, you know, alcoholism is wrong and homosexuality is wrong. We have to think and we have to understand their mindset and we have to use lots of context to show them why God doesn't want us participating in certain behaviors because it's not what is ultimate for us to experience his abundant life. But we need also to present whether you do something or not doesn't change God's love for us. And so I think sometimes people in the church they assume God's mad at someone when they blow it. So they too feel like, well, I got to be mad at that person. And so they kind of think I'm going to join God and being mad at this person. And that is a horrible thing. Uh, and uh, I can honestly say that uh, I was amazed in my experience. The church at large was unbelievable. The upper level leadership group that I was around, it was one of the most horrific experiences of my entire life, being quarantined, lonely, feeling isolated, not being shepherded, not being reached out to, not being loved, being told by one pastor, I can't sit and meet with you because I'm not ready to deal with your sin. Uh, it, it was agonizing for us. And um, I think that while I have to recognize and while we have to recognize when we do something, you know, it might be hard for people to respond. I think that we have to understand how good grace can feel to somebody who is broken. So for my tendency is, man, if somebody's messed, I remember David in New York city, I was there several years ago on another trip, not the one with you. And I saw these homeless people and I was in a dark spot and I thought, I get it. I get it. And I think a lot of people, they, they, they go, what these people, these filth, they just do this, but I'm going, if you can go, see what happens is you can get to a depression that's so bad that the simplest tasks of life can overwhelm you. And you can't even imagine doing the simplest things. And a lot of these people have just shut down because they can't even cope. And it sure some juice the system. Sure some take advantage of it. For me, um, I have a mentor who says, we need to, uh, he's, I, I don't want to judge your journey. I want to join you in it. And that's the best advice that I would say, man, join people in their journey. What happened? I can't imagine what you're feeling. What went wrong? How can we help you? What do you need? 
Instead, we need to do this. We need to do this. We need to do this. And when everyone's freaking out around something you've done, that's hard, man. Mm-hmm. That's really, really hard. And it, if it wasn't for the grace of God, if I didn't believe the gospel so deeply, I, I get why people get disillusioned mm-hmm. and, and never go back to churches if they've been hard handled. And uh, what, one of the one of the things that, that I think is important, which is why I wanted uh, the main reason I wanted to have you on here to discuss this is um, people. Uh, the tendency is for people to kind of cover up their issues and not show what they're not share what their struggles are, because, you know, you're worried about people judging you, yeah. um, looking down on you. Um, and so if you're struggling with something, it's you know, there's a tendency to keep it. Uh, private, but I think it's important. It's important for people to know, Hey, uh, all kinds of other people are going through the same struggles yeah. that you are. And the more these things come out, you know, the less sort of shameful it is to come forward yeah. and say, guys, I have an issue because, uh, at the end of the day, if you're going through some of these issues, you need some help, right? I mean, what, what, you know, one of the most important things is having a, uh, a loving community around you to, to help you through your struggles. And if you're keeping it to yourself and covering up what you're doing, then you don't have that. You don't have those, you don't have that community support. And so guys, uh, if you have have struggles, if you have things you struggle with, um, be honest about those things, Uh, share those things with other people so that other people, um, other people will, will not hesitate to come forward either. They, they will look at you and say, well, if this person is, if this person can come forward and talk about all the dumb, stupid, ridiculous things he's done, uh, hey, maybe I can too. Maybe yeah. I can too and stuff. Yeah, you know, oftentimes, some, I think oftentimes those who struggle to be the most gracious and most merciful are those who are the most unbroken people. People who don't understand their brokenness. A lot of times people, you know, they're just relatively predictable. Their life is a little bit vanilla. It's black and white. It's left brain. Just make this decision. Just do this. And, you know, you can just kind of lay a chart and you'd go through life this way. And, and it's much harder for people who haven't been broken down by dysfunctional family life, by alcoholism and addiction, uh, by a financial crisis, people who just kind of your con- thing, right? The perfect life, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, the perfect spreadsheets, the perfect jobs, the perfect this. They're the ones that are going to be the hardest and they're not going to be able to show as much grace mm-hmm. to people in those types of times. And so I would say the people that are, you know, it's been said before, whenever you point one finger at somebody, recognize you have three pointing back at you. And I think that the sin... Uh, for people to recognize when they struggle with people that are the gluttons, the drunkards and all that is to recognize, well, maybe I struggle with pride. Maybe I struggle with self-righteousness. Maybe I struggle being overly black and white. Maybe I have been blessed with a very good life and a good emotional EQ. And um, it warps me from having compassion in this world. What I loved about Jesus is, I mean, think about the religious people the black and white, the self-righteous, those who thought they had it all figured out, they hated being around Jesus. But the drunkards and the gluttons and the prostitutes and the sinners, they loved being around Jesus. And Jesus had a way of living without sin, yet he must have been like um, such a magnet because a lot of times people who like the self-righteous people, they can project living without sin, but I don't want to be around them. Like I, they make me uncomfortable. Like, but Jesus had a way of being so perfectly holy. At the same token, there was a warmth to him that people just were drawn to him. And man, I think that if we could figure that out as a church, I think we need to do more for mental health ministries, right? The church makes everything a moral issue. The world makes everything a mental health issue. Discernment tells us the difference, whether it's one, the other, or some of each. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up now because, uh, it, it, as, as you saw, if you were watching at the beginning, uh, we have an entire house full of apologists. Uh, we're, we're down here in South Carolina meeting to discuss um, how we can all maximize our effectiveness on YouTube. And uh, so that, you know, once, once we've sort of learned everything, then we can help others uh, learn as well. But we have other people who are going live very soon. I believe John McRae, uh, his channel is What Do You Meme? And he's uh, going live, I believe, at 
30. So he's about to go live as well. So we're going to have to cut off here. But uh, the plan for tomorrow is we're all going to go live on all of our channels. Uh, Jorge um, with uh, Frank Turek's ministry um, has some program that supposedly, we're going to have to see it, supposedly allows you to uh, be doing a live stream, but to live stream on as many channels simultaneously as you want. So uh, this will be Bobby's channel. Uh, what do you mean? Vocab, me, um, uh, cross-examine, and whoever else wants to uh, be involved. But we'll kind of be going live on all channels simultaneously. That's the plan. I will believe it if it actually works because I've never <laughs> seen anything, never seen anything like this. So that's what we're going to be doing yeah. Um, tomorrow. So anyway, we have to get on, uh, off of here. But again, we'll be going live tomorrow. Uh, we'll be live right here uh, with a bunch of us probably be doing Q&A and things like that. And we'll be live again on Wednesday. So we'll yeah. see you all then. Uh, Bobby, any uh, final thoughts for everyone? Hey, just seriously, uh, you know, I just thank you for listening. I know we can't see each other face to face, but in a way we're with each other in spirit and it just feels good to share a piece of my broken heart with a community of people. I'm seeing your comments and just incredibly gracious. And I just wish you all the best and hope you'll come over and be a part of our channel as well. Uh, I'd love to connect more with you. So, all right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Again, uh, again, Bobby's uh, link to Bobby's video. I mean, Bobby's videos, his channel in the description box. So don't head out of here without, uh, without subscribing and see you all tomorrow. Peace.